Guys, you want to hear about the Ford Taurus, right? <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, it's, I, you, you know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, if you're watching this. The old Ford Taurus, the first generation SHO, was kind of badass. I thought it was. Yamaha helped build this you know, engine and it was quick, manual transmission, crazy torque steer, like crazy deadly torque steer. Very cool car. I'm just throwing that out there. But the Taurus I'm looking at buying right now is not a cool Taurus. It's a gold 97 Taurus. You heard it here first, folks. It's $600 with 70,000 miles. What a deal. <laughs> To some, it might be a deal. To others, it's throwing your money away. It <laughs> really depends on the person. You know, the, as I said, I, some Taurus, I mean, those things will go 150,000 miles. No problem. Very cool. Others will not make it past 80. Well, in today's live show, if you're just joining in, welcome to the Ford Maverick 2-liter fuel economy talk. We're discussing the Santa Cruz. We are discussing everything you need to know about the upcoming compact pickup trucks, which ones to buy. And, of course, we are answering your questions in the comment section because we are live on YouTube. Well, that's right, guys. Thank you for joining us. And we've just got some recent news about the Ford Maverick and its MPG numbers. And this is proving to be a very popular vehicle even before it's technically hit the streets. So we saw a leak of a uh, window sticker. This is thanks to the Maverick Truck Club. And what we saw was the fuel economy rating on a two liter turbo, four cylinder, eight speed automatic, all wheel drive with the max 4K towing package. Any guesses on what the numbers were? Uh, 25 combined. Um, I think you were exactly correct, Nathan. Dude, I swear I was, I was guessing on that. I, I, I did not know. 22 MPG City is what this window sticker displayed. 29 MPG Highway and 25 MPG combined. That's for all-wheel drive, right? And it's the max package. Yes. So that's like the heaviest of all of them, for the most part. Max tow, exactly right. So I believe that is somewhat similar to the um, Hyundai Santa Cruz. Zach, can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Do you know the Santa Cruz numbers? I can, yeah. The front wheel drive model, according to the EPA, it's 2.5 liter engine, mind you, 21 miles per gallon city, 26 highway, 23 combined. And that's the best of their, right? Okay. Yep, so uh, the all wheel drive model knocks that down by one so uh the combined figure that is 19 city 27 highway so it's a little bit better on the highway actually in all-wheel drive and 22 combined that's but, unusual but nonetheless ford you know has soundly beat hyundai in that respect i'm very curious to see how the um official numbers for the hybrid stack up because i think if i'm right zach they, they said 40 mpg city Ford says 40 MPG. That's what Ford yeah. says. Official EPA ratings for the Maverick aren't out just yet. Yes. So um, the Maverick, in case you are just tuning in, is a compact pickup. So a little tiny, what would you call that? I'd call it a crossover pickup. Crossover. That way nobody yells at me. If I say pickup truck, people all oh, the little burn things on my lawn. If I say that it's just a crossover with a pickup bed, People get angry about that, so I call it a crossover pickup. I like that. My dad and I came up with, instead of pickup truck, pickup car. I thought that was an <laughs> interesting way of looking at it. But yeah. So the uh, Maverick is based on the same platform as the Escape and the Bronco Sport. Mm -hmm. A little bit obviously different in terms of um, wheelbase and, of course, overall design. But the big news about the Maverick is it starts under 20K, and it's a standard front-wheel drive hybrid. That's right. That's the first thing you get. Entry level is front-wheel drive hybrid powertrain. As a matter of fact, if I'm correct, Zach and Tommy, correct me if I'm wrong, it is one of the least expensive hybrids you can get from Ford. Am I correct? It's the least expensive hybrid if it actually debuts at 20K um, that you can get, period. But that was what they announced. That's so what at they least announced. from what, based on what we know now, in theory, you can get one for around 20 grand. That's really good for something that will be getting, as they say, around 40 miles per gallon. When and is, can haul stuff. When is this supposed to hit dealers? It's supposed to be coming quite soon, right? Fall 21 is what Ford says? Yeah. So it's sometime within the next month or two, they should actually be reaching dealers. Luke, coming in with the $5 on the super check. A big thank oh, you. To thank Luke. you, Luke. Appreciate it. So Luke says you should do old versus new with the Maverick and the Explorer sports track. 
the, so which generation are you talking about? The first or second <laughs> generation? I'm curious about that because Zach has a love for the Explorer uh, sport track. He can tell you about its reliability right about now. So, um, sorry, his he, family member of his has one. The, um, the sport track is a very different machine though, because that was the, very. That was the Explorer. It was an Explorer with a small bed, and it wasn't. It, it's weird because I think what it did, it filled that that void that was left behind from the Ranger not having a proper quad cab, right? Mm. So that's kind of where it was sitting, I guess. And if I recall, that was very truckish. It was like body on frame. It was body have, on frame. Did that have a solid or axle Zach? Do you remember? The, yes. The, sport the, track? First gen. Those, the first and second gen Explorers had a solid rear axle and IFS that had independent front suspension. Okay. Yeah. I, I wonder if the second one did, because the second generation was based on the new body, well, whatever, but it did have a V6 and a V8 option there for the second generation, I think. So Nathan, you are shopping around now for a new truck. Yes. And I'm not buying one of those. Why are you not buying an Explorer Sport Trek? Oh, there's so many reasons. Um, <laughs> the, the main reason is uh, I, I, I want a larger bed. Um, that's just, it's just that simple. So that's more utilitarian in that respect. Um, and I, I'm not a particular fan of it. I, I took one off road, the first generation I took off road and I high centered it. Um, well, yeah, you've been there. You, you've been, you've been to Glamis before, right? Yes. Okay. So I high centered it on a small dune that a <laughs> Subaru, um, brat was able to get up and over. No problem. And that was and it. I was following him actually, and I got so high centered. And it was a friend's. <laughs> trip. So you know, it's it's not a bad vehicle for like regular stuff, for like moving things around, towing things. It was okay for towing, but for what I want it for, not so much. So now that your Pathfinder is done, done, dead, dead yeah, completely dead, would you consider buying like or leasing or financing a base model Maverick? Yes, actually, it's something that it's, I had an interesting talk about that. And it was, the crazy part is my wife, who does not pay attention to these things, she does not watch our shows or anything else because, yeah, um, <laughs> she knew about the chip shortage. And so I started talking about the Mavericks and, you know, I was thinking about a small truck, but maybe something that's a little bit more family friendly so everybody can drive it. So one of my girls can smash it again. And uh, she turned to me and she said, well, if you're talking about something new, what about the chip shortage? And I'm just thinking, huh, huzzah. She must have been watching, you know, Wall Street, who knows, whatever she was looking at. The point is, is that um, I would consider it, but I'm not buying a new vehicle because I never buy new vehicles. That's just my own rule. Um, not for me, at least. I only buy new vehicles for, like, the wife and the kid or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's the reason. So I'd wait a couple of years before I'd buy one. So you've got this little camper you got to tow with it. Is 4,000 yes. pounds enough towing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it weighs 1,200 pounds and then... Once my family loads it up, it weighs 2,000 pounds because they throw out so much crap in there. <laughs> um, but no, it, it, yeah, it's no problem. And we want to buy a bigger trailer, actually. We want to buy something that's not a pop-up because I hate pop-ups now. Um, but that's like in a couple of years. And that would probably be, you know, three or 4,000 pounds. So Kirk is asking, do you think the El Camino will make a comeback? That's a really good question. You know, somebody asked me that question uh, about a month ago. Well, a little over, when you did your first video on the Maverick, which did really well, by the way. He kicked butt on oh, that. Thank you. Um, somebody was asking, when will Chevrolet come out with something that'll go up against it? And Chevrolet, over, not overseas, but down south, they do sell the, um, oh, I just blanked on the name of it. Montana. Montana, thank you. And Montana is kind of sort of similar to the Maverick in terms of its base, you know, kind of car-based platform, not built for really heavy loads or anything else. And they were wondering if that was going to come into the States. And nah, I don't think so. I don't know if it will either, because the interesting thing about both the Maverick and the Hyundai Santa Cruz is um, like Hyundai is marketing it as what the sport adventure vehicle, mm -hmm. SAV, and uh, the Maverick certainly well not targeted as, you know, a proper four wheel drive is definitely based on the marketing materials looking to, to target like the folks who want to go to the cool camping spots and you know, shop at North Face and have all their like trendy outdoor gear on. And both of the new compact trucks are kind of targeted at like that adventure outdoor lifestyle. Whereas like the old El Camino and the Ranchero was a muscle car with the, with the ass cut off. Uh, yes, yes, they were, they were Widowmakers by the way. You know, guys, I grew up at a wrecking yard. Uh, this is how I started my whole thing with automotive industry. And I can't tell you how many Rancheros and El Caminos I saw that had been wrapped around trees in Southern California Ugh. because 
all that horsepower up front and no weight in the back and more importantly some 16 or 17 year old kid driving it oh yeah uh, they they were they were known as like widow makers or you know death machines whatever you want to call them um i i actually kind of disagree with the ford thing though because ford is actually marketing it price wise to a different crowd as well not just this north face outdoor you know <laughs> crowd but also the guys who just want something really affordable that can haul stuff. I mean, sure. you know, think about it. I just, if I had like a little pizza delivery service or whatever, I would love to get one of those with a little box in the back, get really good mileage, hold a bunch of stuff, go everywhere. I mean, that would be an ideal little runabout, right? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Nathan. I don't think it's built for the contractor because of foreign. No, 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 bad. not like that. No. But for someone who wants an affordable truck, maybe uh, even if you have like a small lawn care business. Florist. Yeah, florist uh -huh. would be great. Um, we've got another super chat, Nathan. Luke, once again, coming in with a super chat. Thank you, sir. Hey, Luke, thank you. Toyota should make a RAV, uh, should make a Maverick competitor, the RAV6. Ah, that's awesome. So, um, I'm going to promote myself here. Uh, was it two weeks ago, Zach, that I did that? I believe so, yeah. So, about uh, two weeks ago, I answered an uh, email, a lengthy one, about the rumored Toyota uh, Corolla Cross pickup. Somebody got wind of an image and sent it to me, and one thing kind of led to another. Um, as far as I know, Toyota has no plans to build a small pickup crossover competitor. However, we are talking about one of the largest automakers on the planet. And I think if they saw that there was a little bit of a vacuum, they would try to plug that hole with something. And they have plenty of product to do it with. Hmm. So That's interesting. But it's, it's on Ask Nathan on TFLcar.com. About two weeks. Yeah, put, just type in Toyota... Uh, Corolla Cross pickup and you'll you'll find it. Natalie's saying if they want it to be an affordable hauler they should have a single cab option also. Yeah, um, you're, you're right. I would agree with that with one exception. Uh, think about all the tooling and everything it takes to build what is going to be the most popular vehicle which will be the, the quad cab and then all the expense to build a different version of that on a, perhaps a slightly different platform. A lot of extra money to make that happen. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a, uh, a Subaru enter this class, too. Well, they, they used to own the segment twice. They had the Brat, which we were just talking about, and they had the Baja. And those were, I mean, way ahead of their time, I guess you could say, and very different and unique and kooky. And now, I mean, they have three different vehicles that they could, like, sit there and just cut the back off and reinforce it and make it into some sort of little pickup thing. And they haven't done it yet, and I suspect there's a reason why. Okay. Electrification. Oh, interesting. Because Subaru is about to introduce their new electric vehicle, and they're going to hit hard with electrification. I guarantee it. Well, we all know it. Um, and that's a question of packaging. Suddenly, when you make something electric, when you make an electrified vehicle, you can change the way that it is physically okay. and move components around. And you can make something like a pickup on a modular platform that you can make a sedan and a wagon and an SUV on. Um, Mike uh, has an interesting point. So he says that this would be perfect for like parts delivery for like Napa's and O'Reilly's and that I kind of thing. I completely agree with you. What's the payload? Do you remember offhand? It's ridiculous. <laughs> it was like it, way more than anyone expected. Let me get the number here. Like over a thousand pounds? Uh, yeah, 1,500. 1,500 pounds. Maximum, yeah. <laughs> that, that, isn't that more than our uh, TRX? Um, yes. Ah! That's, That's so embarrassing. Dan Atkins and our buddy Dan says, how much do you think the Maverick will affect Ranger sales? I'm kind of thinking it's a different group of folks, but maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. I think mm. that the price point is very attractive to someone looking for maybe a small car mm -hmm. who actually wanted to um, get into maybe something a little bit more useful. It's that affordable. It's a good question, Dan, actually. And, but, but I'm going to throw something else in there. Remember, Ford is now out of the car game completely, oh. with the exception of the Mustang. So let's put that aside. So they don't have an entry-level car to bring in the youth and also bring in people who might be looking at a truck later on, or they may be able to steer into a truck. I said steer into a truck. Very, Very good. Very yes. good, yes. Um, so the point is, is that this Maverick potentially, especially something that can run with different types of power sources, could bring in a whole new demographic. And I think they could, once again, steer, <laughs> steer them into a Ford Ranger, which makes a lot of sense because suddenly, hey, you want a little bit more utility, you want a little bit more capability off-road, you want something that can tow more, here's the Ranger. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if we, before too long, that we see a Ranger PHEV or a hybrid of some sort that kind of goes up a step from the Maverick. That's my guess. I just wanted to, to your point, uh, I just wanted to throw in a comment from uh, Mike and Willow Conley. He said, all the parts stores that offer delivery will buy at Mavericks. I think that's true. You know why? Because a lot of those parts stores used to buy old Rangers yep. before they went out of production, the third gen Ranger, the small ones. Yep. So by virtue of, you know, those are just little runabouts. They just go around town. You can get away with having front wheel drive. So you probably get the hybrid, you get yeah. better fuel mileage, not terribly expensive. And it's about the right size. Oh, I agree 100%. So, yeah. Not only that, that's but true. with the extra cab, which is standard, you could probably add even more cargo into the thing. I will say the local uh, parts stores around us have transitioned from Rangers because they got too old into Chevrolet Sonics and Sparks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, God. they did. The little hatchbacks, yes. So, but you know, one of the reasons why is if you look at a large fleet that has to buy a thousand cars for one area, let's say, if you're buying a thousand Mavericks that get 40 miles per gallon and can hold X amount, you do the math and you can actually see that these make really good delivery vehicles in terms of what your margins are versus something that can only hold X amount and you have to do two or three trips. Mm. That, that's kind of what I'm saying about it. And I think a lot of you guys might agree with me. And the Napa part thing is dead on. I think that that's a major market. So a uh, bunch of people discussing in the comment section, people are actually very excited about the um, hybrid, which I'm kind of surprised about because it seems like for the most part, for the longest time when people discussed hybrids, they had this image of the first or second gen Prius in their head. And that was like the polar opposite of what pickup truck buyers kind of exemplified. But it's cool to see now that the, the word hybrid is not putting folks off from, from the pickup truck world. Enough of the saturation of the market over a long enough period of time, I think has taken some people to realize, hey, it's not something that will be unreliable in eight years or whatever. I mean, we know people who have had Priuses for oh, 300, 400,000 yeah, miles. Yeah, crazy mileage. Very and high Ford mileage. builds good hybrid technology as well. As such, you're seeing their F-150 pickup break records left and right, and for good reason. Um, and I'm not even trying to talk nice about Andre, but it's a hell of a truck. So having something that, you know what would be really cool? I actually tangent here. If they had a power thing in Ooh. the hybrid truck, mm -hmm. the little Maverick. They don't have that, do they? No, I, honestly, I think at the price point, you're lucky to get four wheels. <laughs> well, I know, but maybe like something for 120 <laughs> volt, you know. So yes, I agree. Them, they would plug in a blender so everybody can have a little fun, you know, at the Parrot Head convention. John Sorry, says, a, <laughs> I don't want to, is, that a, is that a Van Halen thing? Close enough. Um, John says, do you think rental companies will buy Maverick hybrids? They'll try. Uh, rental, company, rental companies are having a really hard time right now getting anything. Um, it's, they're, they're, stay tuned in the next few weeks. You might see some funny stuff from TFL about rentals. But oh, I was going to say, why don't you tell me your story? But yeah, it's probably best to hold off. I'm going to hold off. Um, but I will say this. Um, you're talking about a vehicle that um, if it has the potential for going into fleet sales, which is rentals as well, absolutely Ford will pull the trigger. Once again, they're not building cars anymore. So that's one of their offerings and it makes a lot of sense. I would actually be a little hesitant to be honest with you if I was a rental car company yeah. to have that vehicle without having some sort of movers contract with it to make sure you know a bunch of kids didn't decide to use that to haul a bunch of kegs across the border or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. It's, it's going to be a very utilitarian little truck. Yeah. Sorry, I said truck. See, I screwed myself. There you go. So uh, interesting question from up. David. Why hasn't any car manufacturer, and I can answer this actually, implemented wireless charging for their vehicles, just like wireless charging for their phones? Yeah, so um, typically we think of wireless charging as like inductive charging. Mm -hmm. You probably have seen it where you place your phone on a pad and there's no physical wires. It's a very cool piece of tech, but it's also typically extremely inefficient. So it's a great way to lose electricity in terms of inefficiency and losses. So it's hard to, um, in, a, in, a, in a way that's cost effective, and in a way that makes sense for electricity savings to transfer the energy from like a pad to the car. Not to say it isn't being tried or done. Oh, they've been working on it for a while. I think even General Motors in the very early uh, days of modern electric cars, like in the 90s when they had the EV1, yeah, the that. very early EV1s had a inductive charging paddle. Yeah, and I remember it. I used it. You, did you? Yeah, oh, yeah. And, it, and it looks like um, it, it. It almost looks like a vacuum, like, like a one of those dust 
things. It's a thing that's shaped like so, yes. and you just shove it in there into a port. So it's about that long. And there's a paddle. And I think I was talking to my buddy Alex Dykes and Alex Amados, and he was telling me that the early, um, early inductive paddles on the uh, on the the EV ones were like 50% efficient. So you would lose half the charge getting to the car just because it was such an inefficient way to charge it. But it's also a very safe way to charge it because you're you're typically not going to electri electrocute yourself. So Yeah. Um, in, in the future, they'll probably find a more uh, efficient way of transferring power. Um, hell, Tesla was working. Tesla, the actual Tesla, you know, Nikola Tesla. Have you um, heard of this company called NEO, the Chinese company? There's a company called NEO who's selling cars in China right now, uh -huh. and they're blowing up, and they've got a really interesting service where uh, oh. for 25 minutes, they'll actually swap out your battery. They actually pull it out of the car, put it on a rack, and they have another one that will go yes. in. Yes, so it's a way, I did see that. It's a way to not only charge your car, but if your battery needs replacement, it's like a monthly fee. It's kind mm -hmm. of like you're leasing a battery, but you can just bring it in, call them up, and 30 minutes later, you'll have a new battery in your car that's going to be fully charged. Now bear in mind, this is for uh, certain vehicles in their market that are not available in our market yet. Yep. Um, and it's not for Teslas. But the idea is that there's so much congestion in China and there's so few charging um, areas that in a lot of cases, it is the best way to charge your car is to just plop in a full battery. Well, Elon thought it was a good idea. Remember uh, a couple of years back, he had this whole thing I, set up where yeah. the it automatically went and tore your battery out of your car and put another one inside of it and you could be on your way in less than 10 minutes. I think it was about that, uh, which that never happened. Um, but the point is, is that somebody in China made it happen. Uh, but it's a very different setup. So Sam says the Maverick does have an outlet in the bed, but only 400 watts. Yeah, 400 watts is kind of useless. Maybe we'll charge your phone, but I don't even know uh, if you can I, run I, a blender. I think you can run a computer on that, right? Maybe a computer, Maybe but not like a blender or a Thank fridge you for or... letting us know. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, I, but that's just the first step, right? Maybe in the future, they'll make it a little bit more powerful and progressively maybe do even more with it. Imagine being able to charge your trailer, you know, when you pull up to a place using your hybrid Ford Maverick. I'm just thinking. Uh, Gene says, hey, I want to know how long before we get official TFL 3D printed things for the Maverick interior. That's pretty funny. Um, the Maverick does have an interesting interior. The one I was in was an XLT, and a lot of it was, you know, very affordably produced, which is to say pretty bargain basement. Yeah. But a lot of the areas had kind of funky, like white marble finishes and like bright orange accents. So it was a good way to kind of freshen it up a little bit. Um, Remember the, I thought that the design was great. I've been really critical of Ford's interior design for years and years and years. And only recently, I'd say over the past, say, three or four years, have they really upped their game. And the new F-150's interior is incredible. And the new Ford Maverick's interior, I think, even the base model looks kind of cool, I think. So what do you think of Ford reusing the Maverick name? Because at one point it was a car, right, in the 70s. Oh, I, I know exactly what the Maverick was. Um, the, there were some quick ones out there, but for the most part, it was kind of a grandma's car. Um, they weren't exactly known as being particularly quick. I knew somebody who had one, I think it was, had a straight six in it and a three speed and, you know, they couldn't keep up with anybody. But that was at the same time my dad forced me to drive a um, AMC Matador to my prom. <laughs> okay. Uh, as, as, and that was to prevent, you know, any issues from happening with my date. Uh, and it worked. <laughs> so the thing about uh, the, the original Maverick was that it was a relatively simple vehicle. I, there may have been a wagon as well, but it was basically kind of your mid-level smaller Ford car. Not something sporty like a Mustang and definitely not something like an LTD, you know, right in between. And um, I think they kind of died out near the end of the 70s, if I recall. And honestly other than a TV show from the 70s that was kind of cool called Maverick. Yeah, they just... Now, the earlier Mavericks, by the way, were really cool. I'm talking about, you know, the early, early ones, but that's a whole different thing. Um, but in terms of them using the name, I kind of get why they did it. Oh. It's, it's interesting. You know how uh, Dodge, FCA, Stellantis, whatever you want to call them now, uh, completely dropped the ball when they named their new car the Dart? Yeah. Okay. Not a great name to begin with, and also it didn't really evoke anything, and it wasn't, and it just didn't really work. It kind of felt flat, right? And yeah. the car was never a major success. It wasn't a horrible car, but it wasn't, it was just, eh. Um, this is different. The name you recognize, older folks like me, and at the same time, you're just injecting a brand new character. 
I could totally see this as like Ford guys going, well, we got the name, we might as well reuse it. And there are other names they could have used, um, but this isn't that bad. And now it's part of our vernacular. Everybody's calling the, the Maverick. Nobody has, seems to have a problem with the name. I quite like this AMC Matador. I'm looking at pictures. Oh God, don't. And we're not buying one. It's got Tommy a lot of character. No, don't ever. No, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll go to Jalopnik before I'll let you have a Maverick. Um, a matador. No, I like this matador. Oh, uh, Matt Maverick. Matador, I meant. It's got a lot of character. Oh, it's. There's they always one. sat on its haunches. You <laughs> always blinded people when you drove it. I think the one I had had a, like a. It wasn't even a slant stick. It was a six cylinder, but it's like a tiny little one barrel carburetor, and they had like a three sixty. Oh, yeah, it was just really bad. Nathan, can you agree with me? There are only two cool AMC. Well, one I'd say, arguably two, the Javelin. The Javelin could be really cool. And the Eagle. And, the, and now the Matador. The AMX. And the AMX. What's okay, wrong with AMX? AMX. And the, Sorry. the Gremlin Great. X. No, I no, don't it. say Gremlin. I had no, it. The, yeah, exactly. Not that one. So get this. So I, my mom comes from a family of six. Yeah. And within that family, they had two Gremlins, two Pacers, a Matador, and a Concord. Yeah, they were an AMC family through and through. Wow. God. You do not like that? That looks cool. Don't show me. I like that. I like that, Matador. No, please. That's sweet. Don't. Now, now your dad's going to blame me when you <laughs> do one of those impulse buys and, Dad, hey, we have a... It'll leak all over your driveway. <laughs> it'll, it'll fall over the minute you take it around the corner. It had dreadful <laughs> suspension. And the thing about it was, despite its size, the interior is tiny. Not big enough for people to get into the back seat. Trust me on that. So We have people talking about Pacers. We need to move on. I like oh, Pacers. pacers. Yeah, I, well, you do. I grew up with one. I hated it. Um. And the thing is, real quickly, by the way, the original Pacer idea was supposed to be a rotary-based vehicle. Wow. Did you know that? No, I didn't ah, know that. That's true. I like the Pacer. I think that's uh, okay. cool. I don't like the Pacer wagon, though. That was ugly. Um, so, uh, David says, isn't VW releasing their Toric mini truck? So, interesting thing about Volkswagen, they do currently make a smallish truck right now called mm. the Amarok. Yep. And there is one in my neighborhood. No kidding. Yeah, they don't they don't sell them in the United States, but there's a guy and I gotta get a hold of him. He's Did got he go a, from Mexico. Did he bring it up? Yeah, it's yeah, got okay. Chihuahua plates on ah. it. Yeah, it's this guy. It's got a Ma uh, not a Maverick, a, um, a an Amrock, and it's uh, it's a unibody vehicle. Doesn't mm -hmm. have a low range, but I think it looks great. It's got a cool look to it. It's a uh, basically a crew cab with the short bed, and I think they would sell like the Dickens if they didn't have to get around oh, the chicken tax. Yeah, is it a diesel? Because uh, they did have it, they had um, a, a couple different versions. I think it's a gas vehicle. Hmm. Well, on that subject, I mean, Volkswagen brought the Tarak concept to New York. Yeah, it was a big teaser. Ago. Yeah, big teaser. And they're in talks with Ford. Boom. And I, I thought it was beyond that. I thought that they had an agreement with Ford. Yeah, they do. Okay, and the agreement was that based on the, the ne I believe the next generation, not this generation, next generation um, Ranger platform, they will be building their vehicle as well to get around the chicken tax and also to, to create production quickly because it immediately it will have gone through a lot of hurdles that were required. And I believe we're talking a different sheet metal. I'm not 100% sure on powertrains, but otherwise in terms of platform and probably most of the running gear, it's going to be a lot of Ford stuff underneath. How about an AMC Hornet? That's an interesting one. No, I, you know the Hornet wasn't as bad as the Matador. The biggest thing about the Matador is it was just such such a terrible driving car. Imagine living, you know, near <laughs> Topanga Canyon, Mulhall and Han Canyon, and trying to drive that thing around. It was it was terrible. Um, by the way, if you guys have good memories about the AMC's, go ahead and let Tommy know. Apparently, he's on a kick. Yeah, for sure. No, I think that's a great idea. So. Going back to the new Ford Maverick pickup truck, if mm -hmm. you could get an XLT, which is the mid-level, or the Lariat, which is the top level, which one would you get? Well, which one would give me the, um, are you talking about the hybrid, or are you talking about the uh, four-wheel drive? I don't think it matters. I think you can get both trims in both. Well, I thought the, you could only get the, um, there was like a... Well, so if you want the hybrid, you can only get front-wheel drive. Right, right, right. But isn't there like an off-roadish off version? Well, there's the FX4. Right, that's probably what I'd get because... And that's the two-liter yeah. Yeah, gas engine. So that's what I'd get. So the FX4, and someone asked if we'll test it, absolutely we'll test it, but the FX4 is the off-roady trim. Yeah. 
but it does not get the same sophisticated all-wheel drive as the Bronco Sport Badlands. Yeah. So in the Bronco Sport Badlands, you can get this crazy rear diff that's got dual clutches and like it simulates a locker and it's really cool. If you want the Maverick, you can only get it with basically the base Bronco Sport all-wheel drive, which is a single clutch setup. So they don't really have the full off-road goodies that the, the little Ford Bronco Sport has. Which, by the way, is a vehicle you want to compare to the full-size Bronco. Yeah, I think, and uh, you guys go ahead and chime in on this, I think it would be a great video for us to take both the Bronco Sport and our very own Bronco up and through the woods. I think it would be fantastic to do a whole series of videos pitting one against the other, not necessarily trying to, you know, obviously we know one won't perform as well as the other off-road, but it'd be interesting to see what the differences are because they're both selling like hotcakes. And at the same time, they're very different vehicles. And I think there's a big, there may be a bit of confusion out there for some people regarding what the Bronco Sport actually is versus what the real Bronco is, real, the large Bronco is. James says, do you think if Chevy and Ram would bring their compact trucks to the U.S. if the Maverick is really successful? I do, but I don't think they can bring them in in the current configuration. Because mm. if you look at like the Montana, I think yeah, is, that's it, Montana. it's a very, very primitive truck by American standards. And um, they have different levels of requirements for not only crash safety, but interior refinement. And oh, everything. It would yeah. it'll be very difficult and very expensive to federalize. Uh, and also to pass through DOT standards. The bottom line is that it's really expensive to, to really take any vehicle and sell it in the United States. It would actually be less expensive probably for them to build a vehicle like the Maverick up from nothing into an actual truck and build it and sell it here or in a country that doesn't require chicken tax and whatnot to come in. Um, mm. But with that being said, keep in mind one important thing when you're asking about Chevrolet. Chevrolet made a uh, a declarative statement. We are building nothing but EVs after. Was it 2030, Zach? Okay, so 2030. That's not that far away when you think about it in terms of development and, and you know, implementation. So we know for a fact that they're doing a, um, a Silverado EV to compete directly with the Ford Lightning, right? So what's to say that Chevrolet won't build a smaller truck platform that will compete with the Maverick, but maybe all electric or hybrid setup of some sort? I think that's a better possibility than bringing in something from outside the United States. And um, one of the last questions we'll do here, Nathan, uh, what do you think of the revival of a Dakota? Oh, I wish they would. But, you know, I think that that time kind of passed. And on top of that, there's one huge problem. What? Gladiator. Okay. Because I think that Stellantis would look at that and go, well, it's going to sap sales of our base model Gladiator or whatever. And I mean, gladiators are so overpriced as it is, and they really are, um, that if you were to build a small pickup truck that had some of the similar type of capacity at, at a certain level, you know, payload and towing, um, yeah, it, it would, at least a little bit, it would leech off some of the sales from the gladiator. And perhaps some people who are like, ah, I really want a cool looking truck and I, I don't really need to go off-roading, maybe I'll get this instead. Believe me, a lot of Jeep guys are like, look, this is our best-selling brand, and we really don't want anything to compete with it. So I think that that is one of the issues. I think it would be an interesting um, potential because the Gladiator is, as you mentioned, a very expensive truck. Even yeah. even the base models are still going to run you high 30s, realistically. Realist right now, they would. Right I mean, now. technically speaking, if you go on to an online configurator, you can get one at like 33 or whatever. There's no way It's you're not going to happen one. in the real world, no. So if they came in with a... Uh, mid-sized truck marketed as a Dakota that was maybe more aimed at like the Ranger, mm -hmm. so more of a work truck spec, uh, so at least entry level. Maybe they could undercut the prices into the high 20s. I, I, I would love it, but as I said, I just don't know if that's a, there's a good business model for that. But Ford's doing it, technically speaking, with the Maverick, so who, who's to say? Yeah, I think that the, the Dakota name still, even in um, 2021, I'm reading the comments, it's got a lot of recognition. I love the Dakota. Actually, the second generation, the rounded one, I, I absolutely adore it. I, it was one of the ones I considered uh, until my wife saw how old they were. And... So, yeah, let's talk about this for a little bit here. Uh, You're looking at buying a new truck mm, to -ish. replace your Pathfinder, mm -hmm. newish. Uh, what is on your short list? I almost don't want to give up the Ghost because, let me put it to you, full-size trucks. Uh, but there's a variety of different full-size trucks dating from... 2002 to about 2015. Okay. That I've been looking at full size, which is interesting. Full size. I wasn't expecting mm -hmm. that. I yeah, thought you were I, more I like small. I like smaller trucks, 
but I'm sick and tired of the ladies in my life crashing my vehicles and having them destroyed after one hit. So why not get a bigger truck that can take a hit? <laughs> um, I'm actually into the idea of getting a larger trailer and I transport heavy stuff. I've been rebuilding a whole <clears throat> house and I gotta tell you, having the ability to load a ton of stuff into the back of a truck really is nice. Uh, DIY all the way and all that stuff. So yeah, I'm looking at a full-size truck and no player is out. No I'm, I'm looking at Oh yeah, I'm looking at everybody. Um, and okay. that's the problem of being an automotive reviewer is that I've driven all this stuff that's 10, 15, even 20 years old as a reviewer. And so I've had a critical point of view. And then I'm looking at them now as a possible buyer thinking, hmm, well, maybe I can overlook that one little problem. And that's actually become a bit of an issue because it's an argument every night with the internet and my wife. Okay, so are you, your, your Pathfinder did pretty well in terms of its evaluation from State Farm. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking probably under 20K, is that where you're looking at? I'm looking around 20. Yeah. About 20. Mm -hmm. There's a lot out there. Well, yeah, it's, this is the worst market to buy something right now. Jason, this sucks right now. Yeah, Jason says get a power wagon. <laughs> oh, that, that was a very short conversation because I, when I realized that there was a check coming in and everything else and, you know, oh, okay, maybe I can buy something, I was strutting upstairs and I think my wife overheard me go, power wagon, don't care, like in the distance is my little thing, right? <laughs> And I just kind of heard this, oh, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and I just, oh, she caught me, dude. And, you know, honestly, I have to drive 45 miles each way to get to this office from where I live in South Denver, right? So as much as I love the power wagon, the idea of spending 150 to $250 a week to fill it up, that's a lot of money. So I'm, I'm thinking of something a little bit more efficient. Mr. Spork says best work trucks are two-wheel drive. Not in Colorado, they're not, because you can't get to work if you can't go. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good Sorry, point. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Under, in terms of like longevity and all that stuff, yes, but I need four-wheel drive. I, I have to have it. Plus, I go off-road. And you wouldn't consider a full-size SUV, huh? No. Nah. I'm done with SUVs. I, my kids are growing up. I got one who's driving. I got another one who will probably, you know, I don't know, take over the space shuttle next time one goes up. So I don't really have to worry too much about putting a bunch of little people in a car anymore or a truck. Hmm. I need to worry about Nathan being happy, and Nathan likes big trucks. Well, Alan had a really good suggestion. Unimog. Unimog it is. If they can only make one that would go like 80. Um, <laughs> Not 40. <laughs> well, you could probably get one that goes up to 60 miles per hour, give or take, but you know, our highways, actually we go to 75 miles per hour here in Colorado, so I would like something that can perhaps go a little bit more than that. And also the bottom line is with a Unimog, yeah, I'd rather have something that wouldn't cost me a whole mortgage in order to maintain. So a surprising number of people are asking about your leaf. What's the deal with the leaf? How long, is that going to be a permanent addition to the Adlin household? Yeah, my, my daughter loves it. She, it's, she absolutely adores it. You know what she loves? She, the fact that she A, doesn't have to go get any gas or really worry about the car very much. And that none of her friends have anything negative to say about it. One of her friends comes putting along in her dad's BMW and all of a sudden, oh, you know, <laughs> oh, you're looking, you know, someone's looking down on us from driving that BMW. Nissan Leaf is completely, it's unassuming. It's absolutely like lefty and green and people playing hacky sack and all the stuff that, you know, all the TFL staff does. The point is, is that it's a really easy car to maintain. It's been super cheap over the year and I've, I've been pretty pleased with it. Yeah, it's had one minor issue with the air conditioning, but I, I don't care about that. As mm -hmm. a runner, it's great. Dan says, would you get an electric power wagon? No. If... Why would I want an electric power wagon? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Well, the thing about a, a, you know electrified truck in general is right now the best range that we're expecting from Ford is uh, 300 miles, right? And that's okay. I just don't need a truck like that. So having a power wagon, which is built to do even more off-road, electric would mean less range, which means more weight and da da, da. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know what I mean? It doesn't make, no. But uh, would I buy an electric truck that looked like a power wagon? No. Someone says you can charge an electric with an adequate solar setup. Not really. Not if you're realistically driving it around. The amount of solar panels you need to charge an electric car it's, is it's a lot. ridiculous. I mean, you need, a, you need a football field worth of solar panels. Not quite that much, actually. I know exactly how much <laughs> square footage you need. It's, because I have a friend who's near Cheyenne who has, he has two electric vehicles and one gas vehicle. Why does he have the gas vehicle? Because his huge 
field, which is um, like probably a quarter acre at least. It's, right? it, no, it's more than that. It, it's about a half an acre, and half of that half an acre, so a quarter of an acre, uh, mostly solar panels. He's got a ton, and they power his house and his shop, and he's one of those doomsday type people, and he has electric vehicles because he doesn't want to pay anybody for gas or anything like that. Well, they don't, you know, you have to charge up these bank of batteries and they have to charge your car. It doesn't just go directly into it, right? Because you have to have things reg uh, regulated. It takes a lot of power and a lot of time and you have to maintain those things. And he also has wind power. Wow. So it takes a lot of work. Has your electric bill shot up since the Nissan Leaf? No, because we, we charge it at night and I use 110 and I just have it kind of casually go, usually between here and there, say no more than 10 hours of charging. Okay. And I, you know, low, during low load hours, and I've actually been able to compile the bills. There's a way to actually track how much you're huh. spending on it. And um, I think per month I was spending on average, just from my house, about 15 bucks a month on fuel, electricity fuel. And that's going back and forth here and all that. Now, granted, I got power up here to go back home, but still, if you think about what I'm doing and the fact that my wife was driving it around, my daughter was driving it around, pretty good yeah well yeah. guys let us know what you think thank you for joining us on yeah. today's show it was a good one yes so next week we'll be back for another tfml live show and as always if you've got more questions leave them in the comment section below we'll try to get them after the show goes um into into a normal video thanks guys we appreciate it we'll see you next time